I believe we need to enter God's rest concerning mistakes of the past. You can't do anything about your past. So you might as well leave it with God and say, if you can't take care of it, I certainly can't. And I'm not going to let my past destroy my future. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that tomorrow, but let me just remind you that your past only has as much power over you as you give it. And that may be the past of 20 years ago, or it could be something you did wrong out in the parking lot trying to get in the building. <laughs> but you have to let go of the past in order to enjoy where you're at right now. Let me tell you something, time goes by so fast. And days just seem to fly by and years fly by. And it's Christmas and then it's Christmas again before we know it. And we just, we can't believe sometimes how fast life goes by. And I thought today, you know, when you get a little bit older, you begin to, you begin to want to value your time even more than you do sometimes when you're younger. Because, when you, you know, when you're in your 20s, you just think you got forever. But, you know, we all know that even if you have a long lifespan, by the time you get to be in your 40s and 50s and 60s, that... You've already used up a lot of your time, and I was sitting in the hotel room this afternoon, and I looked at the clock, and it was 6 p.m., and I thought, now, I got up this morning at 7, so I've been up 11 hours. I think I'll just take a little quick inventory of what I have spent those 11 hours on, because I don't want to waste any more of my time. And it's a good exercise sometimes at the end of the day to just ask yourself, now, what did I do with these 16 hours that I was awake today? What did I do with this portion of of my life. Did you spend it worrying? Did you spend it being concerned about what somebody thought of you? Did you spend it upset? Did you spend it, you know, laying around, being depressed and feeling sorry for yourself? Or did you put that time into something that was fruitful that you got some value out of? And you know, I thought, well, first thing I did, got up this morning, made my coffee. That's a good thing for me. <laughs> then I spent the next couple hours with God, going over my notes and praying and getting ready for today, so that certainly wasn't a waste of time. Then I came over here and I preached to you, and that certainly wasn't a waste of time. And then I went and got my second coffee for the day, because that's what I allow myself. And then I went out to lunch with some great people and had some good fellowship, so that wasn't a waste of time. And then I went and got a little nap and got up and studied a little bit more and looked at the clock, and it was 6 o'clock, so I knew what I did with those 11 hours. Well, I'm happy to say that I didn't just lay around somewhere with a bad attitude all day, and lose all that time. Don't waste your time. Make sure that you're doing something with your time that is going to count. Don't be living in the past, but enjoy the time that you have. Enter God's rest concerning the past. Enter God's rest about the unknowns of the future. To be honest with you, nobody really knows what the future holds. Not anybody. I said to one of the girls that works for me yesterday, I said, I wonder what it'll be like 10 years from now and who'll be working for me then, who'll be traveling with me. And, you know, we always like to think that everything's going to stay the same, but to be honest, it rarely ever does. And so you have to be ready for whatever. And you have to know that God's in control and that whatever you need to do, He can help you do it. Don't be the kind of person that's just petrified of change. Don't even say, I hate change, I hate change, I hate change. Because you know what? If you hate change, you're going to hate most of your life. Oh, good. Three people understand that. <laughs> you know what? I've just made my mind up. I'm going to adapt fast to change. Because one thing is for certain, things are always going to be changing in some way, shape, or form. Enter God's rest if you don't know the call on your life. I get so tired of people being upset because they don't know what they're called to do. If you don't know what you're called to do, then get up and start moving and do something. Try something. You'll find out pretty quick what you're called to do and what you're not called to do. It only took me two weeks to find out I was not called to work in the nursery. <laughs> but I might have never found that out had I not tried it. Don't worry about what you're going to do in the future. Don't you agree that too many Christians are upset about that? Oh, what's a call on my life? What's my gift? What's a call on my life? Just go outside every day and be a blessing. Just be a blessing everywhere that you go. That's a call. The Bible says, serve the Lord with gladness. That's a call. I'm just going to be glad. 
You know, I think a lot of times teenagers get so much pressure on them because every teenager gets asked this question, probably by everybody they know. So what are you going to do when you get out of school? What do you want to do with your life? I mean, they're 17 and somebody wants to know, what are you going to do with your life? And I've talked to some of them and it really puts a lot of pressure on them. I guess because everybody's asking the same question, maybe they think they ought to know the answer. And there are a few who do, but there's a lot more who don't. And you know what happens a lot of times? And I think we need to stop pressuring young people to come up with that answer. We need to tell them, you know what, if you don't know what you're going to do with your life right now, that's okay. Because can I tell you something? Most of you did not know what you were going to do with yours at that age. And even those of you who thought you did it didn't turn out the way you thought it would. So let's just take the pressure off of the young people and stop demanding that they know their future at the age of 16, 17, and 18. Maybe you need to tell some of them, well, when you get out of high school, why don't you take a year off and get a job and enjoy life and don't feel like you just got to run off and do something else. Get, have some chill time. Be, you know, just get quiet. Let God speak to you. After being in school that many years, they might need a break. Well... I bet all the young people love me tonight, even if some of the parents don't. <laughs> Here I am, preaching the gospel to two-thirds of the world every day by television. And when I got out of school, you know what I did? I was a bookkeeper. And for a lot of years, I was a bookkeeper. And then I was an office manager. I mean, I've worked in restaurants. I've, I've done a little bit of everything. I've been a secretary. And it sure was a surprise to me one morning when I was making my bed and God said, you're going to go all over the world and teach the Word. <laughs> and I was in my 30s when I found out what the call of God was on my life. But you know what? All the other things that I did have helped me do this well. So really, everything that you do will help you do the thing you're going to do even better because in God, nothing is wasted. So just calm down about all the stuff you don't know. You need to enter the rest of God concerning your children. <laughs> oh, what's going to happen to Junior? What's going to happen to Susie? I'll tell you what, my four kids are grown now and I am so thankful that they are grown. I'll tell you what, I did not cry when one of them left home. I mean, I know there are people who get what's called an empty nest syndrome, but I tell you what, my, my son bought me a sign the other day and it says, I childproof my house, but they, they get in anyway. <laughs> and my blessed four didn't go very far, but it didn't hurt my feelings when they moved out of the house. That didn't mean I didn't love them, but you know, when you get older, you want your own little space. When my kids were growing up, I could go through each one. I mean, my one daughter out there, there is no way that this girl could ever leave home, pay her bills, hold down a job, and ever keep any... She'll never find anything. She won't know where her car keys are at. She won't know where her shoes are at. She won't know where her clothes are at. What is she going to do? I just don't know what she's going to do. And actually, there were two of my four kids that I felt that way about. I mean, they didn't do good in school. They hated school. They didn't get good grades. I mean, they were just real, wee, wee. everything's a party and all a ball of emotions. And I was just like, what? <laughs> well, one of, the, uh, one of those children was our son, who is now the CEO of our stateside ministries and oversees all of this media. <laughs> and the other one that I was talking about has four children and just does great and they take very good care of their money and very good care of their children and her house is even clean <laughs> most of the time. Can I share a scripture with you that I think is going to encourage some parents tonight? Go to Jeremiah 31. Say, my kids are going to make it. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it. Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17. These are yummy scriptures right here. Are you ready? Thus says the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and your children shall return from the enemy's land. 
Wow. Woo. And listen, and there is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children shall come back to their own country. Now, every time the devil tries to get you upset about your kids, will you get out Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17 and read it to him out loud? He obviously does not know this scripture. <laughs> I'm telling you, you don't have to be worried about your kids. Mine made it, and yours will too. And I'm not saying that they'll never have a season where they may do some things that you don't particularly care for, but all you can do is raise them right and trust God. And even if you haven't done a great job of raising yours right, it was almost like I could sense somebody saying, well, yeah, but I didn't raise mine right. I was a mess, and I'm just now trying to get myself straightened out, and I've made so many mistakes. Well, you know what? God's a God of restoration. And He can redeem those years that you wasted. And if you grow up in God and learn how to walk in Him, your children can see such a mighty change in you that they're going to want what you've got. Come on, this meeting is about hope. So enter God's rest. Now, Last scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. How shall you run your race? Well, first of all, you can't lay down and run. You've got to learn how to sit. That, that takes time. It takes time. Sometimes it takes years to learn how to live in the rest of God. Then you learn how to stand. You learn how to deal with the enemy. You learn his character. You learn how to recognize him. You learn about his lies. And you learn how to take authority over him. You learn how to not let him bother you. Then you learn how to walk. And a walk... Is made up of steps, and every step that you take is a decision that you make. You decide every day how you're going to walk that day. Are you going to walk in the flesh, or are you going to walk in the spirit? Are you going to walk in love, or are you going to walk in selfish, self-centeredness? And then after you learn how to sit, stand, and walk now, and not before, you're ready to run. Now, this may be disappointing to some of you, because you don't want to mess with the rest of it. You just want to run your race. But I'm doing you a favor tonight by telling you that it's going to take some time. And if you don't want to put the time into your walk with God, then don't ever be jealous of somebody else who's got a strong walk with God and has victory in their life and has overcome their problems. I'm telling you the same thing is available to you if you will do what you need to do to have the victory. Thanks for listening.